Welcome to Algebra 1, Function Rules, Tables, and Graphs. I'm Mr. Polarski, and our objective today is I will be able to model function using rules, tables, and graphs. I want you to pay close attention. The title of today's lesson and the objective today include the same words. And the reason that is, is that there are three ways to represent data. And those ways are as a function rule, table, and a graph. This is the three ways we can represent data. A function rule or an equation. Those words are interchangeable. A function rule or an equation. A table, which we usually create from the equation and a graph which we then create from the table. So we're usually given the equation, we have to create a table, we have to create a graph and in this lesson that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to be given equations or problem solving situations, we'll have to create a table of data and then we'll have to create a graph of that data. So let's take a look at example one. When we have three views of a function, remember we have the equation, the table, and the graph. Here's the example. Model the function rule y is equal to one-third x plus two using a table of values and a graph. Well, we're given the equation, so let's just make a note of that here. We're given this information right here. So I don't have to worry about that. Now, you may be asking yourself, what do you mean we're given that? Well, this is the equation right here. Y is equal to one-third x plus two. This is the given information. We want to model that function using a table of values and a graph. So what we have to do is we have to create a graph from a table. So we first have to create the table. And to create that table, we have to take this equation and get it into this table with four columns in it. Now, this is how we get the four columns. The first column is the x value. If you know anything about equations, the x value is your independent variable or your domain values. You may have heard it called input values, but that goes at the front of the table because these are values that we are going to pick we're going to pick these values. Actually, in this example, I'm going to pick the values, but I'll explain to you why. Before we do that, we need to finish setting up the table. So in here, after we pick our input values, we have to put it into this part of the equation right here. We'll use the substitution property of equality to do that, or just the substitution property. So we'll pick whatever values we choose for x into this variable, we use the order of operations and that'll give us our y value. The fourth column is really us getting ready to create the graph. When we get to here, we're done making our table, then we can make our graph. So, on to making the table. First, we need to pick values for x. Some kids might be inclined to pick negative 1, 0, and 1, and that's okay, but I think there's a better choice than negative 1, 0, and 1. And I think because we have a denominator of 3, if we pick multiples of 3, we can cancel out the fractions. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. If I choose the three values, let's say negative 3, I always like to pick a negative value, 0, and a positive 6. I could have chosen 3 here, but I'm choosing 6. And substitute these values in. So in for x, I substitute 3. Actually, it's a negative 3. Once I replace that x with negative 3, I do the math. 1 third times negative 3. There's a couple ways to see this. When I was taught to do this when I was a young man, I think in about 6th grade, I was taught to think of negative 3 as a fraction. Negative 3 over 1, and the 3's divide out. 3 divided by 3 is 1, and negative 3 divided by 3 is a negative 1. And then I do the math. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. So I have 
finish the multiplication. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. If I divide that by 1, which I don't have to, because it's the identity property of division. Negative 1 divided by 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 plus 2, that's going to give me a positive 1. So when I put in negative 3, I get out a positive 1. So that's going to give me my ordered pair, negative 3, comma, 1, which then I'm going to be able to create my graph from this set of ordered pairs at the end. So when I substitute in 0, I take 1 third times 0, and I add that to 2, 1 third times 0 is 0, anything times 0 is 0, then I add 2, that gives me 2 here, and a second ordered pair of 0, comma 2. I get to the third number here that I chose. Remember, I chose these, chose these numbers. You can pick any numbers you want. I think these are some of the easiest numbers to work with. I substitute in 6. Not there, though. That should be a 3. We clean that up. That should be a 3. So it would be 1 third times 6 plus 2. 1 third times 6. 1 times 6 is 6, and 6 divided by 3 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. So that gives me the ordered pair, 6 comma 4. I've now created my table. My x values that I picked. Here's the math. Here's the work to get my output values or my y values. And I take those and put them into an ordered pair. Now I can create my graph. Remember the horizontal axis is the x-axis and the vertical axis is the y-axis. I'm going to plot my first point and I'm going to call it point A, negative 3, 1, starting at the origin. You go to the left 3 and then you go up 1. My second point, I'm going to call point B, 0, 2, starting at the origin. Since it's 0, you don't go left or right, you just go up 2. So that's my point B. Finally, my third point, 6, 4. Go to the right 6, and then up 4. And I'll call that point C. Finally, draw a line through them. I don't have the exact right line right now, but good enough. The reason we're drawing a line through them is because uh, we're going to consider this uh, continuous data. We're going to have a little discussion about that later on. The only problem is I should have an arrow at each end because this does go on forever. So here, after we created our table, we plotted the points that we got from the end of the table on a coordinate plane, and we created our graph. As you see, I'm going to work through the next three examples here. It's going to be a lot of the same. We're going to have a couple of problem-solving situations, then we're going to talk about parabolas and absolute values. Example 2, real-world problem-solving. In Example 2, we're still going to be talking about equations, tables, and graphs. Let's see how those three words relate to the problem we're about to read. At the local video store, you can rent a video game for $3. It costs you $5 a month to operate your video game player, meaning probably electricity and whatnot. The total monthly cost, C of V, depends on the number of video games V you rent. Use the function rule C of V equal to 5 plus 3V to make a table of values and a graph. Even if you don't understand the problem, what you should be able to do is look at the problem and know you have an equation. Just looking at the problem without really even understanding what all the variables mean, you should recognize that this right here is an equation. It's actually a function rule because of the way this is written. This is written C of V. This is function notation. In a previous lesson I discussed how that was f of x or g of x. In this case, it's C of V, which means the cost depends on the number of video games you rent. That cost is equal to $5. Now, that's a basic monthly cost to operate your video game system, plus 3 times V, 
3. The cost of renting one video game times V, the number of video games you rent. To make a table of values and a graph. We need to take this equation to make a table of values and a graph. Just from the way this function is written, you should know that this is the dependent variable or the range values. The V is going to be the independent variable. Typically when equations are written like this, this is the dependent variable and this is the independent variable. So when we set this table up, our independent variable comes first, V. This portion of the equation where we input our values comes next, 5 plus 3V. What comes next is C of V, the dependent variable, and then we have our ordered pair, our input value V, and the dependent variable C of V. This is very different than what you're used to seeing. You're used to seeing X and Y, and now we have V and C of V. This is just the dependent variable. You could just call it C if it, that would make it simpler for you. Instead of C of V, you could call it just C. C, the cost. The cost depends on the number of video games you rent. So we don't have to do anything crazy for our table. Again, we get to pick the values of V. And we could pick 0. That's always an easy number to work with. We could pick 2 and say we pick 4. We can't rent a negative number of video games, so we have to have all positive numbers. They're nice evenly spaced out, so it'll give us a really good idea of what the graph is going to look like. So I substitute 0 in for V, 5, plus 3 times 0. Now you may say, why do you need to write that down? We know the answer is 5. Well, the reason you need to write it down is because you're creating a table. This way, you can follow the order of operations if you need to explain it. 3 times 0 is 0, plus 5 is 5. So that gives us the ordered pair, 0, comma 5. When you rent zero video games, it's going to cost you $5 a month to keep your video game plugged in. When I rent two video games, I substitute two in for V. Follow the order of operations. Three times two is six, and six plus five is 11. That gives me the ordered pair, two comma 11. And finally, if I rent four video games, I substitute four in for V. 5 plus 3 times 4. Follow the order again. 3 times 4 is 12, and 12 plus 5 is 17. So when I rent 4 video games, it's going to cost me $17. Now I need to make a graph. The deep independent variable, the independent variable is always graphed along the x-axis or the horizontal axis. Along here, the dependent variable We'll put C of V. If we look at our values for V, 0, 2, 4, we could comfortably count by 1. So if I put 0 here, 1, this would be 2, 3, 4. I didn't go beyond 4, so I don't really need to go any further. If I look at my dependent variables, my cost, if you will, slide down a little bit. Remember, this is the number of video games rented. And over here is the cost. I've labeled the video game axis. Along here I need to put in a scale that I can go from 5 to 17. I think counting by Twos would get me up to 20, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, easily cover me. So from here, it's be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18 dozen. And then when I graph this, whenever I have zero video games, the intercept where it crosses the dependent axis is 5, that'd be 0, 5, and then 2, 11. When I rent two video games, 
my cost is eleven dollars. And when I grab when I rent four video games, my cost is seventeen dollars. And you can see that cost would be constant. We could uh, calculate or figure out the cost of one video game. That would be eight dollars. Here we're doing a little interpretation. But anyway, that's not what this example is asking you to do. It's asking you to take this equation relating the cost to the number of video games you rented, putting it into a table, and then putting it into a graph, which we've obviously done. What I started to do here was just some interpretation. I didn't actually graph that, and it's not actually in my table, but I used my graph to figure out that this would be a good point on the line, and to rent one video game is going to cost me $8. What you need to understand, too, as we move along, is that we have uh, the first example of the lesson. We had a, an example of continuous data where we put a straight line through there. Here we have discrete data, which because we can't rent a half of a video game, only 0, 1, 2, whole numbers, if you will. Here I can put another point that I didn't make on my table, but if I rent three video games, it's going to cost me $14. And I could extrapolate upon that, but we're not going to do that now. And we're going to see in this upcoming slide uh, the difference between continuous and discrete data. We've already seen an example of each. Example 3, Discrete and Continuous Data. I think this example would be better titled Discrete or Continuous Data if we check out the actual question here in a second. At a ball game, they charge $2 for a hot dog. The function C of H is equal to 2H describes the cost of H hot dogs. Is this discrete or continuous data? Represent this with a table and a graph. Well, to accurately create our graph, we're going to first have to decide is this discrete or is this continuous data, and really be able to explain why. If we think back to the definitions of continuous and discrete data, continuous data involved a the use of measurement of any kind where values in between the whole numbers had meaning. 
the definition discrete data, was really about a count of items, whether it be people or animals or the sale or purchase of items. It doesn't really matter as long as whole numbers were important. That really is the, the key thing for discrete data is understanding that it's about whole number values, things that we can actually count. In this example, we're talking about H, the number of hot dogs. And if we look at our example, it tells us right here the cost of H hot dogs. This part of the sentence really describes the relationship, the cost of H hot dogs. How, many do, how much does H hot dogs cost me if I were to buy them? Well, if they sell them for $2 a piece, I multiply how many I buy H by 2, and that will tell, tell me how much I spend. We're counting the number of hot dogs. Therefore, this is a discrete set of data because we're counting hot dogs. Okay, because we're counting hot dogs. That's the OG right there, hot dogs. Um, so this particular problem, H, is our independent variable. This is what we have control over. I have control over how many hot dogs I buy. What I put in here is this part of the equation, the part opposite the dependent variable. And in this case, it's a really easy expression, 2H. This is our dependent variable, which is the cost of the hot dogs, the cost of H number of hot dogs. Then our last column is our ordered pair our independent variable h and our dependent variable c of h. And really, this just ends up being two numbers. A lot of people get overwhelmed by how this looks. I tried to make that look like an h, but it didn't really work out. So let's pick the number of hot dogs. And in this case, I'll just say if I buy zero hot dogs, if I buy one hot dog, two, three, four, it should be a pretty easy thing to do. Two times zero. Substituting zero in for H gives me zero. So if I buy zero hot dogs, it costs me zero dollars. One, two times one is two. So if I buy one hot dog, it's going to cost me two dollars. And continuing this table, it's a pretty easy thing to do, putting two in for H. Two times two is four. So if I buy two hot dogs, the cost is four dollars. I'm not going to continue with that. That should be pretty easy for you. The idea to remember when we're moving to the graph portion, remember we were given the equation. We just created our table. Now we're moving over to the graph portion. The independent variable, in this case the number of hot dogs, goes along the independent axis or the x-axis. One, two, three. Actually, I guess we should start with zero. Numbering my H axis, my number of hot dogs I'm going to buy axis. Along the Y axis, we could easily count by ones. Our data is not that big. It's actually a very easy problem. And from here, we graph our data. If I buy zero hot dogs, it costs me zero dollars. If I buy one hot dog, it costs me $2. If I buy two hot dogs, it costs me $4. And hopefully you see the pattern there. Um, between each dot, I can go up two to the right one, up two to the right one. So if I go up two and to the right one, that puts me on the data value three, six. So if I buy three hot dogs, it's going to cost me $6. And we can extrapolate one more, four and eight. go up two to the right one from there to get another data point. But since this is discrete, we do not have to draw a line through it. So this is graphing a discrete function. We're going to take a look at uh, a couple another a couple examples of parabolas and absolute value functions coming up next and how they look and be able to describe those a little bit.